do you do? And welcome to the Midwest Farm Report. Our special guest on this program today will be members of the NFO, the National Farmers Organization. You'll meet a farmer, you'll meet some farm wives. This program is brought to you and sponsored in the interest of agriculture, small business, and the welfare of the nation by the members of the National Farmers Organization. How do you do? My name is Coleman Scott, and it is my privilege to be the moderator again today on, on this particular broadcast. And I would like to have you meet my guests on this program. First, may I present to you Maynard Rafferty. Maynard, your home is where? Uh, Coleman, I live at, uh, near Grinnell, Iowa, which is about 50 miles east of Des Moines, where I farm. And what do you farm? What type of farming do you do? Uh, I have a dairy and grain farm, produce grade A milk there. Now may I present to you Mrs. Faye Brim. Mrs. Brim, where is your home? We live about 80 miles south of Des Moines. Which county do you live in? Decatur County. In Decatur County, south of Des Moines. Now on the end, last week I introduced, uh, or rather on one of these previous broadcasts, I introduced you to Kenneth Johnson, whom I told you was acting as probably the most exciting individualistic performance I'd ever seen. Here is a farmer, and he and his wife had gone to the state capitol in Des Moines and were working with legislators as lobbyists. I'd like you to meet the other member of that team, Mrs. Kenneth Johnson. Mrs. Johnson, where do you and your husband farm? We farm near Calendar, which is in Webster County, about 82 miles northwest of Des Moines. I see. And Mrs. Leonard Felber. Mrs. Felber, where is your home? Ames. And where do you and your husband farm? And what type of farming do you do? Uh, we grain and livestock farm, cattle and hogs. And Ames is what? Uh, geographically, how far would you say that is from Des Moines? About 32 miles north of Des Moines, where the Iowa State University is. Well, now that we've established our guests, I'd like to tell you a little bit about today's program. It is probably one of the most challenging experiences that any interviewer can have when you talk with people who have established patterns of success themselves. On a previous broadcast, we talked with you about corporate farming. I think we mentioned how beef traveled a corporate route through a rubber firm to a food chain. Now, it had been in my experience in the state of California to have visited this particular area in which this one story had been centered. For miles and miles and miles and miles and miles, we travel through the area owned by this one company. It is a large company, a company that has an asset of 2,414,112 acres. Now, if you ask yourself how big this is, it would give you an idea if I told you that it was so large, it would encompass between seven and eight counties of the state from which we are now talking to you. What would it mean if we had various corporations like this, all in farming? It would be like 12 to 14 corporations owning the entire state of Iowa. Now, if that causes you to re-examine your thinking and say, well, how big is it? Let me go a little further with you. This particular one firm that we were talking about had recently made a purchase of 8,000 head of cattle from a firm in a rubber company. Now, the particular firm that we were talking about had 47,000 head of cattle in the feed yards in one area alone. Give you an idea of how big it is? It is so large that when I tell you that their major outlet is one of the largest food chains in the world and that they have recently bought it out to have an outlet for their product, you then become aware of the magnitude of the thing we'd like to discuss with you today. Before we get into it, realizing the size and the scope of this one question, remember we're going to ask you as farmers, as businessmen, as teachers, as lawyers, as bankers, as other people interested in America, to let us tell you this story. And if you'd like to have additional information, we'd love to send it to you. But let us ask you as independent businessmen, if you are not farmers, how are you 
as independent businessmen going to stay in business if the nation's economy consistently is being placed in the hand of fewer and fewer and fewer farmers. Today we're going to bring you a problem. A problem about the 11 farm families that disappear and one local businessman goes out of business. We'd like to talk with you about a thing called parity. What it means and what it means to you. We'd like to ask you how free enterprise can work if the condition of the declining American farmer continues, where will rural America be? This is obviously then everybody's responsibility. We must all join our hands to be able to maintain free enterprise as we have all known it. The American system of the American farm family. Now on these programs we have told you again and again and again that the great problem that the American farmer faces is first he produces a product over which he has no control as to its cost and second he has nothing to say about what he's going to get when he sells it. Now you say this can't possibly be so. Less than 20 minutes ago for the first time I talked with a man you are now going to see demonstrate these very facts. His name is Maynard Rafferty is the gentleman that you met that I introduced you to first. He showed me a formula that is so exciting, I wanted him to show it to you. Maynard, show us this formula now. Coleman, uh, this is a very simple formula which every business operates under, whether they know it or not. And uh, it is units times price minus costs equals net income or profit. Now every business, if it is to continue to be in business, must show a profit over a period of time. Otherwise, it will go out of business. Uh, we as farmers are in a business, and we can control only one of the factors of this formula, and this is the number of units. Uh, practically every other business in this country can control two parts of this formula, units and price both. Uh, well, now wait, let me stop you, if I may, just for a moment. You say, we can only control the units. You mean the production, the unit of production? Bushels of corn. Numbers um, of heads of cattle that go to a market, to uh, chickens or whatever they may be, right? Pounds of milk. Now, you say then that the manufacturer can produce exactly what number of commodity he wishes to produce in order to protect his price? That's right. But the farmer is not now doing it. Uh, we are unable to price our product, therefore to maintain our profit or net income we have only one recourse. We must crank out more and more units. Uh, as you know, the American farmers are the most efficient farmers in the world. No question about this. And uh, we... And we, they pay the penalty here, in both, and here. Right. As I understand, recently I saw the demonstration that showed that the farmer was actually paid on the ratio of the production of 10 units, but he had to produce 14 to get the same amount of money today. That he got paid only, what was it, 15 years ago, I think, 1950. That's correct then this becomes your formula of units times price minus the cost equals the net income. Yes. Well, now you're back to NFO again. This is what the National Farmer Organization has been saying for years, that if the farmer were to bring to market those units at a price which made him a profit, when he had removed his cost of operation, he would then have a decent net income that allowed him to be a good purchaser himself. Is that, is, that, is that the point that you were making yes, for us? Yes, but uh, th this has many uh, implications, too. Uh, let us for a moment consider the food industry. Uh, the food processors and the chain stores, they can control all three factors here. They have a rather unique advantage in that they price their raw material, which is farm products, as well as their finished product. They price it, too and they control the number of units. Well, many of them actually work backwards. They determine their net income that they must have and thus establish the price. If they must have a 7% or 8% markup, they then determine what this, these two units will be and then determine the buying by it. I noticed uh, recently a commodity that uh, only a few weeks ago was selling for, uh, I think, 16 cents. It is now 39 cents, and it happens to be right in the middle of the season of production 
Which is a strange thing, isn't it? I believe these people decided they wanted to make a profit while they were doing Somebody business. Somebody decided to make one, I can tell you this. <laughs> well, now, if you as a farmer were able to, formula, uh, to formulate a policy of operation and operate on this basis, how would this change the way you now operate? Well, uh, Coleman, uh, this, this is NFO. And in NFO, we have what we call bargaining committees who have uh, determined what a fair price for a farm commodity would be. This price is based on cost of production, which is the same as every other business must do. And, and this, we, we know that if we are to continue in business and be businessmen, we have to do this. In other words, it's impossible for a grocer to sell eggs at 26 cents and continue to have a source of supply of eggs that he's going to sell at 26 cents if it costs you 26 cents to produce it. He's obviously got to be able to add his price and his profit to be able to buy. But the, the guy, well, then obviously, then the guy that's paying the subsidy is the farmer. Yes, that's true. The American farmers are, are subsidizing the American economy and that American people buy their food cheaper now, today, than they have at any time in history and at, at any time in the history of the world. The American people buy their, their food cheaper than any other country at any time in the history of the world. It's the strangest thing is we're going through a policy now of destroying the source of production. We, we are uh, swiftly eliminating farmers through this cost price squeeze. I recently read an article, it was a very old article, I think it was a 1958-59 article called uh, The Time and a Half Farmer, and it pointed out that in order for a farmer to work full time on his farm, he had to go out and work exactly half of that amount of time somewhere else to make a living. This was the strangest formula I had ever seen for success. What about this thing now? Do you think that if it were possible for the farmer to control, that is, all the farmers, let us say that all of the farmers together were to be able to say, it takes this many head of cattle to constantly keep a good flow of red meat on the, on the American table. We know what it costs us to be able to produce them. We know that if there's too much of it, they just say to us, well, there's a surplus, and this is all we're going to pay you for your stuff today. That if we were able to control this part of it, allowing ourselves a fair profit, minus our cost, that having an increased net income, the farmer would be able then to buy, to increase his purchasing power, thus creating the ability of the, far, of the uh, city worker to buy more merchandise also, because they could do, buy more of his stuff. Well, this would be a tremendous uh, boon to the American economy if, if farmers could again take their rightful place in, in, in the purchasing part of, of our whole total economy. Let me ask you a question now as a farmer. How big did you say your area where you, uh, your farm is? I have 240 acres. All right. Now, you know what it costs you to own 240 acres. You know what it costs you to operate them. Do you think that the average farmer today, with the investment that it takes to own or to buy and pay for 240 acres, has ever figured it out as a business and still refused to join in the National uh, Farmers Organization? I, I don't think, uh, I think most farmers have uh, never uh, taken the trouble to actually figure out their cost of production. Now these figures are available through our state universities uh, on, uh, in statistical averages for the, the various states. And, and it can be figured out on an individual farm basis, but I, I would say that very few farmers have ever actually done this. We, we just are not that much of a businessman as yet. Well, is this because it has been too long a period since the farmer has been able to bring in his units and get a price for it? Is that what's caused this? What's, bring, what's brought this about? I, th I think this is a matter of habit. We, we have uh, had our stuff priced by the buyer for, uh, for uh, over the years, and, and I think we're in such a habit that, that uh, it, it will take uh, uh, something very powerful to uh, get us to break loose from this habit and, and change. I don't know. You brought forth probably one of the strongest points I think I've ever seen brought forth by a businessman who says that despite all of the things that he does, unless he is able to find some new release from the type of marketing that he does, and ultimately you're actually saying you're walking on the verge of bankruptcy. Is that right? Many farmers No matter how are. successful he is, he ultimately is walking on the brink of bankruptcy. I, I think that the, the figures will show that the average American farmer today is getting uh, one of two things. He's getting paid for his labor or he is getting a return on his capital investment. He is not getting both. 
and uh, no, no other business can afford to operate this way. I was talking with a lady today. Briefly, I figured out that the investment that she and her husband had were better than a half a million dollars. And without a single doubt, the only way that they're able to stay in business is to be able to do five people's work. Now, there are very few men, few businessmen who run a business and expect to have to do five people's work to be able to make the living of one, but that's essentially what it's pointing to. Maynard, I think you brought forth some good points. I hope we'll have an opportunity to come back on this one. Uh, Mrs. Brim, Mrs. Faye Brim, I introduced you to early, earlier. Mrs. Brim, you are a farmer's wife. Is this right? That's right. How long have you, or let us say not in say in years, have you been on the farm a great many years, or is this a new experience to you, or what is it? No, we've been farming most of our married life, close to 30. About 30 years. Then during this period, you've obviously seen many, many changes in your own system of buying and selling the merchandise, that is, the buying the things that you buy and selling the things that are produced on your farm, right? Sure have. Well, let's, take, let's go back to this thing a minute ago. We were talking just before we came on the air about the, the periods that exist approximately 1950 in relation to the 1965 when the farmer's income was largely almost equal to that of, uh, of the factory worker. How has this affected your ability to buy today? Well, I think we buy about half as much as we did back when the prices were more even. Then even though you produce approximately 40% more merchandise on your farm, your purchasing power is approximately 50% of what it was. That's right. Well, I don't know. If I were sitting out there at this moment, as a farmer, bear in mind now, and I had the very same problem in my house, I believe I'd wanted to get a lot more information. And let me ask you, if as farmers you want this information, may we invite you to contact your nearest National Farmers Organization chapter, regardless of where you live, if this problem is your problem, we'd like to discuss it with you. We'd like to show you how the only way in the world it is possible for the American farmer to bail himself out of this particular position is through the unified strength of every farmer in America. But forget it's your country, and the country you save may very well be your own. I talked recently on one of these broadcasts to a man who said that he and his wife were acting as lobbyists in the state legislature when it met in Des Moines, Iowa. Now, probably there was no experience that could be more challenging to a farmer than to sit down and be able to talk about the laws which have played such a large part in the problem which agriculture faces today, because many of those problems, many of the laws that were written were actually written without full knowledge of the problem itself. I introduced you earlier to Mrs. Kenneth Johnson. I now want you to meet her, both as a farm wife and also as a lobbyist. Mrs. Johnson, tell me something. First, how are the kids standing up under this thing of you being gone so much of the time? Not too well. They kind of like to have you home, huh? Yes, they're lonesome. They look forward to weekends. With all the bad weather we've been having, we're going to have to have school on Saturdays. So they say they only have one fun day now. <laughs> I'll bet grandmother will be happy when the legislature is over, I can assure you. What exciting things have happened to you in this legislature? Oh, so many things. Recently, since we have become more acquainted, many of the senators and representatives have brought bills to my husband to be investigated, so to speak. Uh, you can't understand a bill just to look at it. It refers to section so-and-so of the Code no, of Iowa. And these all have to be looked up in the library. And he sits down with them and spends hours doing this to see just exactly what the bill means. And then he takes it back to the senator or representative with his recommendation as to whether or not they should vote on or how they should vote on the bill. Have you found them uh, most anxious to receive this assistance really from the farmer himself? I certainly have. We haven't asked them if we could do this. They have brought bills to us. Well, I think that's stimulating as can be. Let me ask you something. Now, as a farmer's wife, do you see any great future for your children on the farm today with the position that the farmer is, is placing himself unless 
either legislation can be written to find some way to cause the farmer to change his way of marketing, or unless the marketing programming is changed by the farmer himself to make his purchasing power better? If marketing isn't changed, I see no future on the farm for our children. And if it isn't changed, even with all the ground we farm, I hope our children don't farm. Well, I can't think of anything else I would like to hear less than to hear from a successful farmer's wife that she hopes her children don't farm. Unless things change. I said, unless things change. Well, she made the first step. She and her husband are members of the National Farmers Organization, but she and her husband left their homes to come in and talk with legislators about the problems that face the farmer. The next step appears to be up to most of the farmers, but there is a step ahead of him. For a long time now, there has been a move to be able to reduce the number of farm families. Now, whether this affects you or not remains to be seen. Mrs. Felber showed me a magazine a moment ago in which there was probably the most exciting story I've seen. Mrs. Felber, what is this story? Uh, this is from the U.S. News World Report of March 22, 1965. And it's in the President Johnson's State of the Message speech to eliminate two and a fourth million farmers. Wow. Two a and a quarter million. <laughs> yes. All right. What did you find in that article that struck you so strongly? Well, um, the farmers that are going to be left, evidently, will be the small, inefficient farmer. The farmer that farms part-time and works part-time. In other words, the real farmer will disappear. Yes. Um, it also states here that northeast part of the country will lose 150,000 farmers. That'll be 65 percent. And every t approximately uh, 11 farmers disappearing from a farm means that one businessman disappears. Mm -hmm. In the south, 1,180,000 farmers, or 79 percent. Midwest, 860,000 farmers, or 65 percent. And the west, 210,000 farmers, or 66 percent. Well, my friends, I don't know whether you happen to be in this group of those that are slated for removal to someplace else. I don't even know where you're going to be sent, but apparently you're going to be sent away from the farm. Now, one of the big questions that has been asked repeatedly is what has happened to the farm income? Now, this was an article that I came across tonight, just before, just before we came to broadcast. It was handed to me. It says there's a new way of saying parity for the wheat farmer. This was injected into farm talk when Representative Purcell, as a Democrat from Texas and chairman of the House Agricultural Subcommittee on Wheat, introduced a bill to make the farmer have a return on domestic food wheat of $2.00 and a half with an escalator provision that tried to change to the average hourly wages of manufacturers' workers. Now, he went on to say that city people don't understand parity, but they do understand escalator clauses because they've got them in labor contracts. But he went on to say that the marketing spread on bread has increased 80% in the last 20 years, but that if farmers had an equal share of the increase, they would now be getting $4 for a bushel of wheat. But the question was, how much would this increase the cost of a loaf of bread? And the answer is about a set of loaves. Now, we were discussing this bit of parody before we came to the air, Maynard Rafferty and I. Maynard is the one you met a moment ago with his formula of the net income structure here, units times price minus cost equal net income. Maynard, give us about a 90-second rundown on this meaning of parity. Parity, would you, as a farmer? What is, how would you describe it? Well, parity is defined as the index of prices received, that's farm prices, to the index of prices paid. In other words, it's, it's this old cost-price squeeze thing. Index of prices farmers receive to the prices farmers have to pay. I have here a copy of the Iowa Farm Science Magazine, Iowa State University at Ames. On the back page of the February 65 issue is the parity prices. 
and in 1934, parity prices were 75 percent. They have been higher than that every year since, but they have gone down practically every year in recent years, and now we are back down to 75 percent of parity for 1964, which is the same as we were 30 years ago in 1934. So essentially the farmer's basic income is figured on the 1934 price structure today. We, we have progressed backwards 30 years now to 1934 and the cost price squeeze for the American farmer. Well, if you think that's strange, let me point something else out to you. During the period that we've been talking about, the farmer's share of the retail food cost and the typical market basket on food products fell from 51% in 1947 to 37% in 1964. Now the consumer food prices rose from 51 and 3 tenths percent to 95 and 6 tenths percent and then up to 106 and 2 tenths percent while the farmer's share of it was constantly dropping. Now the question is who put the pressure on the prices and what caused the food prices to go up? Nobody wants to deny anybody a profit. Nobody wants to say that the distributors or the processors or anybody else that took part in the handling of the raw farm product and delivered it to the food market, that he wasn't entitled to a product and a profit. Nobody wants to take his profit away from him. But somebody has taken the profit away from the farmer. And it doesn't make sense to constantly make the farmer the goat of everybody else's subsidy, now does it? If you're a farmer, we'd like to talk to you about it. We think there may be a place in the National Farmers Organization where you will find the answers that you need. Heaven knows we hope so, because too many people are dependent on you as a farmer. We've said again and again and again, the farm you save may be your own. This is more than just a slogan. This is a basic positive fact. And in the National Farmers Organization, we have done much to bring you this information and the help that you need to understand it. Because through combined and unified marketing, we will then be able to present to the general public the best way to be able to buy the product that the American farmer produces. We will also be able then to produce for the farmer himself and his family a just return from the honest sweat and the labor that he has produced not alone for the work that he's done, but for the investment that he's made, and to pass on to his children something much better than a sloppy heredity which we have already wasted into bankruptcy. My friends, there is a place for you. There is a need for you. May I thank you for your time, your friends and neighbors who have shared in bringing this program to you. Would like to express their appreciation for the opportunity to discuss it further with you. My name is Coleman Scott, and on behalf of our guest today, and all of the members of the National Farmers Organization, may I say thank you and goodbye. Rural America's future and our national economy is everybody's business. Now, because of the nature of our economy, when agriculture is sick, this disease, your friends and neighbors who have shared in bringing this program to you, would like to express their appreciation for the opportunity to discuss it further with you. My name is Coleman Scott, and on behalf of our guests today, and all of the members of the National Farmers Organization, may I say thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Rural America's future and our national economy is everybody's business. Now, because of the nature of our economy, when agriculture is sick, this disease spreads into all other segments of economic life. Nobody is immune. A special invitation is extended to farmers, merchants, bankers, to everybody to write NFO in care of the station to which you are listening and express your opinion. This program has been presented in the interest of agriculture, small business, and the welfare of the nation by the members of the National Farmers Organization. Tune in next week for the Midwest Farm Report.